There you go. Yeah, so anytime you want to start, Mark, go right ahead. Ah, yes, thank you. It was good. I was muted that whole time. <laughs> <laughs> um, take two. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I was just saying that I hope that you are all having a wonderful institute so far. Um, can I just can you give like a thumbs up if my the the volume of my voice is good and I'm coming in loud and clear? Anybody? Okay, good. Maureen and Kelly, thank you. And Andy. Yep. Um so so welcome. Um, I know that you had, this is a fantastic conference, and I know there are lots of really wonderful workshops, so I really appreciate you uh, making the decision to come and spend some time with me. Um, my, my name is Mark Trishkowski. Um, I know some of your names, but I don't know many of you, so I'm very excited to have this opportunity to spend some time. Um, and what we're here to spend some time doing is understand the geometric formulas on the GED math formula sheet. Um, and and that's what that's what we're going to do. So we're going to start off um, just looking at some of the formulas. We're going to jump right in. Um, and we can spend all the time that we have together today answering these questions. So I just want to get some of them in the room. So for the next two minutes, um, if you could reflect on the questions on the side, and you can you can write in the chat there. Um, but looking at these, and these are the, the two-dimensional geometry uh, formulas from the GED formula sheet, um, but just what is challenging about using these formulas? What is challenging about teaching these formulas? If you have experience, you can certainly speak to that. If you've never had that experience, you can look in and imagine. If you had to 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 uh, teach these, what would be challenging? Um, and yeah, let's take about two minutes and see what what we come up with in the chat. Uh, they're coming in. So getting students to understand how to adjust the formula rather than just plug and chug. Students don't necessarily know what operation to do when the two letters are next to each other. Absolutely, right? These are all expressed as algebraic formulas, those equations. Challenge for teaching, says Kelly, ensuring students understand the why, not just plugging in numbers seemingly randomly. Amanda says choosing which formula to use. Absolutely. Elizabeth shares exponents, subscripts, fractions, right? There's lots of formal math notation that's involved in how these are expressed. Um, what is challenging is having the student actually look at and use the formulas, says Laura, thank you. Uh, Leanne shares using, um, what's challenging about using them is understanding the convention of how multiplication is indicated. Um, so kind of echoing some of what Chris was saying how different they look when the numbers are plugged in. Absolutely. Oh, these are all so great. I can't even read them all. We can Understanding wh what the variables represent. Absolutely. Um, from Cindy, Abby says, students might have memorized a formula which is represented a different way here. And so they're not seeing the connection between all of them. Um, so I'll, I'll keep keep these coming. This is rich. All of this is to say there are fra we are fraught with challenges. There are many challenges, um, and we're we're identifying um, great ones. Some that I've thought of, some that I haven't even thought of that I appreciate. Um, all all of you sharing them. Um, one 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 thing just to kind of one thing that stood out to me once I kind of underwent this project, which I'm I'm going to describe in, in a minute. But um, but just the the way that the use of different variables on this. Uh, on the formula sheet kind of hides the relationship between the formulas. They, it kind of presents them as if they're each these separate things, but really um, there is a sequence there if, 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 if you seek to present them in that way. And so it's challenging that that's, that's not here in the way that it's, um, it's structured. There's also a lot of repetition. Um, I think that area and perimeter are both much simpler than they're presented here. Um, uh, and this kind of gets to what some people were saying about the formal notation, like, a lot of geometry is concrete, Like Geometry literally means measuring the world. Um, and these formulas are very abstract. And so there's a lot of formal abstract and algebraic notation that goes into the, the, how they're expressed. Um, so, so this is great. I'm just going to quickly, I can't read them all, but I just want to get a sense. Oh, these are so wonderful. Students may need to understand a word problem and connect it to the appropriate formula. If someone else said something like that, and that was, that's huge, right? It, 
knowing which formula to use, like the, this, if we think about this, these formula as a toolkit, um, first of all, it's an incomplete toolkit, but also you, you can't just, you have to know how to use the tool. You have to know which tool to pull out of your toolkit. So, um, so these are great. Um, thank you. So, um, so I just, oh, and I, I'm sorry, in the beginning, I, it was on the screen, but I didn't say, I, I work for the City University of New York, um, the adult uh, literacy program there. Um, and so, so, so at CUNY, um, the City University of New York, uh, we received some funding to develop a series of math packets. Um, and so there are packets that we created that are covering, or not covering, but exploring uh, most of the math that is found on the GED. Um, and these are the two packets that I'm particularly gonna be drawing from today. These are two of the four that focus on geometry, um, two-dimensional geometry and three-dimensional geometry is, is, is kind of how we chose to, to break up the topic. Um, so I just want to say a little bit about the project because it, it, it kind of goes into for the frame of, of what we're going to be doing today. Um, so these packets were created um, for, for teachers to use them in classrooms with students and students to use them. Um, they were also created for students to use independently because there's some distance learning programs in um, New York that these were, they wanted those students to have access to them too. So they were kind of written to be used in a classroom, but also um, for students to be able to use independently. Um, so in these two packets, I explore all of the geometric formulas uh, that appear on the, the GED. Today, I'm going to lead us through a few of them, um, certainly not all. Um, so, so when I the the task that I set for myself when I when I started writing these um, was to make sense of all of the formulas and to make them concrete to myself, um, because they're describing the real world, and so I, that was like a really important thing that I I felt like I needed to do. Um, and so, what I'm going to be doing today is sharing sharing that journey, sharing how I made sense of the formulas. Um, and you may found that you have made sense of things in a different way than I did. And to which I say, yes, do that. Um, I am offering my own journey as a start, um, and I'm encouraging you to play around with these formulas in a way that makes sense for you. Um, if you're like me, like I had, I had done some thinking about some of them, but not as much about others. Um, so. The, the one thing that I just want to say off the bat, um, and this is for all of you, but particularly for the students that I was writing this for, is I wanted to make room for others to make sense of, of it, of the, of the formula. Um, because as I was making sense of the formulas, I was understanding them better. And that was an important part of my learning, actually playing around and trying to figure out what that was. So I, didn't want, I, I don't want to do that work for students. I did that work for myself. And so in the packets, what I tried to do was figure out activities to get my students to do, to give them space to do that same sense making that I did. Um, and the takeaway is, you know, I, the takeaways that I wanted students to have, I mean, there, there are many, but, but a couple that were really important to me um, were these formulas are understandable. Um, you don't have to memorize them, not only because they're on the pack, uh, on the, you're, they're given to you in the test, but you don't have to memorize them because there's, like I said, there's a connection between them um, that you can that you can use, um, and also that understanding. And somebody said that uh, several people said this in the chat about the challenges, um, but understanding where they come from the, helps understand how to adapt them and how to use them because they're not. They're tools. They're, they they don't do the thinking. Formulas can't think for them for us or for themselves. Um, and so understanding where they come from helps us use them fluent fluently. Um, and just one final piece. Uh, I believe that that understanding where the formula comes from helps our students build positive math identities. Um, I know every time I discovered something, and I I feel you know I'm a math professional developer. I've been teaching for twenty years. I like I have a pretty confident math identity, but I still felt really good um, because it, it's, it's, and it's something like I want my students to feel that, that really good. Um, and that part comes from figuring stuff out on their own. Um, because I think, you know, like someone, Andy, I think it was mentioned plug and chug. I think it conveys something to students when we say, just plug these numbers into that formula. Um, I think it conveys something else when we engage students in pulling apart the formulas um, and making sense of them. Um, so I'm just going to peek at the chat. I see that a bunch of people have been coming in. Um, um, so there's a couple of questions. I'm going to, so this one here, Natalie says, do you think most of what you're describing today will be relevant for pre-GED students as well as GED? Um, thank you for that question. Um, 
So the packets were written for um, for students for GED level students and students who had a particular reading level, because at, at least for the students who had to do them independently, they they have to work through them. Um, but I would also say that, and and kind of I'll, maybe I'll go to the next slide as I'm as I'm answering this question. Um, oops. Ah. <laughs> um, so I tried to use real objects when I could. So these are all pictures that I took um, as that are in the packet. Um, but I tried to use real objects when I could and be as visual as possible. Um, and so these are just, well, just to answer your question, Natalie, I'm sorry. So I tried to use real objects and, and be visual. And so I think that I don't, I think the packets can be used at students at any level. Um, but I certainly think that less text and more images would be used for pre-GED students. I mean, I think you would figure that you like that's your skill set, um, you know, particularly working with your students. But um, but that's my I hope not too long of an answer to I think that it is relevant for for all students um, or certainly pre-GED students and GED students. Um, Um, so, so just what we're looking at, um, it's it. There is a little bit of a trailer. Consider this a trailer of sorts, because, like I said, um, these are photos that come from the packet, but these are examples of explorations that are in the packet that we will not be getting to today. Um, I had to leave some some things on the cutting room floor, and so these are some of the examples. Um, uh, so the the surface area of a sphere and the volume of a of a, um, a pyramid. Uh, those are some things we're not going to be getting into. So, but if that seems exciting, that's 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 what lies in a wait for you. Um, so, there are many places that we could begin our conversation about geometry. Um, I am choosing to start here. Um, does anyone know where in the world this is? Carmen San Diego. No. Does anyone know where in the world this is? Not San Diego. You can you can put it in the chat or you can unmute if you any guesses. Persian Gulf. Someone says Turkey, Egypt. A couple of guesses for Egypt. Um so, so this is this is Egypt. Um, we have this. Egypt is is the satellite picture of Egypt. This is the um, bulk of this picture is Egypt. There's some. You've got some Palestine um, and Israel and Jordan to the east here. You've got the Mediterranean Sea to the north, um, the Red Sea uh, to the southeast. Um, but this is this is Egypt. Um, and so the reason why I wanted to start here, you you might notice this the green line here, um, and so. You can guess in the chat what it is, but I'm going to tell you. So you've only got 10 seconds. Um, this is uh, the fertile land that goes along that follows the Nile River. Um, so this is this is Egypt, and this is the Nile River coming down here. And then to the to the right, it's the the image you can see at night. So you can kind of see how where civil is where people are living in relation to to the um, to the river. So. Um, the reason why I wanted to start here um, is because uh, the Nile River has an important had an important role to play in the in the development of of kind of how we think about area today. Um, so the Nile River floods every year, um, and so it comes up and it creates these these fertile floodplains, um, and it leaves behind all this rich soil, which is great for for growing crops. Um, and so to make sure that everybody got a fair share of the land and collect taxes. Particularly to collect taxes um, from from farmers at harvest time, the ancient Egyptians needed to figure out a way how big each piece of land was. Right, the amount of of taxes that people were paying depended on the size of their farm. The bigger the farm, the more taxes um, they had to pay. So, if you imagine two, this is an unimaginative picture compared to to the the beauty of of the other images. But but just to imagine that these are two parcels of farmland, right? And we needed to figure out who should we tax, which which of these should be taxed more. Um, the top one, which is bigger? The top, top one looks wider, but the bottom one looks longer. So which one is bigger? Which farm should pay more in taxes? Um, and how much taxes should they each pay? Um, that's that's an open question. There's, there's different ways to kind of think about that. 
Um, but to answer that question, the Egyptians came up with the following idea. Um, they imagined covering the farms, covering that land with squares. Like if we could take this land and cover it with squares, and then we could count the squares and we could compare that. And that's area, right? Area, we think, area is the size of a surface. Um, and the ancient Egyptians gave us this way to measure surfaces by asking how many squares it takes to cover that entire surface. And that's the key question of area. So in the case of these two lands, uh, these two parcels, um, if we count the squares, the top one has 36 squares and the bottom one has 33. Um, so so we, we use different units and we're gonna talk about our units in a minute, but I, I just thought I would share because I found it interesting um, that the the, basic unit that the ancient Egyptians were using to measure land was the ket and the square ket. So they imagined a square ket, which is a, a square um, that measured a ket long on each side. And a ket is about 100 cubits, and a cubit is about the length from your fingertips to your elbow. So do with that what you will. Um, but I thought that was cool. Um, but we use different, we use, you know, that we use different square units. Um, and so, a couple that I'm just going to show here, and this is all, these are all from the packet. Um, but uh, a square inch is equal to the square uh, to a square that measures one inch on each side. So we think about covering a surface with squares that are one inch on each side. And and for each, I'm going to give us a couple of units. And for each, I'm going to give you some real world ways to kind of think about them and conceptualize them. Um, so those are two for for square inches, um, a square foot is the area equal to a square that measure, measures one foot on each side. Um, so we think about, again, a surface that we would cover with squares that measure about a foot on each side. I got really into 12 inch. I, I'm not going to share images of it here, but in the packet, my daughter and I, I subjected my daughter, we ordered pizza and I have a pizza box still downstairs that I, I covered with squares and, and things as we were we were exploring this packet together. Um, also, if, you, if for, certainly in schools, I see Andy put floor tiles or often square feet um, or sometimes ceiling tiles as well. Um, and a square mile, again, it, 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 the, the unit can change, but the idea of a square unit doesn't change. It's a square that measures one of whatever the unit is on each side. So a square mile is obviously the biggest of these three units. Um, and it's a square that measures one mile on each side. So we've only looked at one example, but but we've so far we've had squares drawn on to cover the surface of each rectangle. So what what do we do when there's there's no squares drawn in? Um, so how do we figure out how many square inches it would take to cover the surface of this rectangle here? So there's there's many ways to answer that. Um, one way. Uh, is to think of, we know that the rectangle measures six inches across. And so we can imagine of six squares across, each one measuring one by one, one inch by one inch. So six of them would fit across. Since a rectangle measure, measures three inches down, we can fit a total of three rows, right? One row of six, one row of six, and one row of six. So when we wanted to know what the area of this is, we want to know how many squares there are in this space. So that's 6 plus 6 plus 6. So 6 plus 6 plus 6 is 18. We can think of it as, a, as an addition problem. Or we know um, here, I wouldn't say that to students, because not all students know, know this or, or need to even make this leap. Um, but another way to add, to, to add in groups is to multiply. So 6 times 3 is 18. And that's our first formula. Um, length times width gives us the number of squares, uh, also known as the area, the number of squares that it takes to cover the surface. So as I was starting off, I started here because I was like, well, that's that felt good. That's a, it's, it's easy to fit squares in something where squares can fit. Um, and I had done a lot of work and thinking about arrays and, and all of that stuff. So that, that all felt pretty good. Um, and it's not to say that this next shape didn't feel good, um, but it was it was different. Um, so here we have um, a parallelogram, <coughs> and 
And so how many squares does it take to cover this surface? Actually, why don't you take a minute um, and put in the chat any way that you, you can answer that question. How many squares does it take to fill uh, to cover that surface? And I'm sorry, by the, by the parallelogram, I mean the shaded area. Sorry, I did not was not clear. I see that uh, maybe one or two people have put in. I'm not going to look at the chat until I'm going to like count to thirty. So don't worry if somebody else does it. Just put your answer in. Mm. Some of you are kind of giving me some ideas or using expressions to give me some idea about how you thought about it. Um, but so I'm seeing a lot of similar answers. I'm seeing 20 and 21 as the, the most, uh, as the two answers that have shown up. Um, so that's great. So I'm curious. So when I, cause when I look at this, right, if the question of area is how many squares does it take to cover a surface, I'm counting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. I'm counting 17 full squares that I can see. But then there's like this other stuff here. And I'm curious how, what people did with that. Um, I think that's gonna be a little bit hard to communicate in the chat. So if if we could have a brave soul, we're all friends here. Just, a, just a, maybe one or two people, just how, how did you estimate, how did you figure out what to do with these partial pieces? So Eric uh, said, I'm a, I'm a physics teacher. So I, what I did is I straightened out the lines and I, uh, I just counted the boxes and I multiplied it by three. So you, when you say you straightened out the lines, oh, for, I'm sorry, actually, first of all, I can't, I have like a big thing with everybody's name. So I didn't catch who it was, who's speaking. A uh, Mark Quackerfuss. Mark, see, I should know that because that's my own name. Um, so Mark, if you could explain when you say you straightened out the pieces, I love it. Talk to me. Talk to us. I took the I took the two lines on the right and the left side. And I first of all, I looked at it and it looked like the same, except they were opposite. So basically, I straightened I straightened them out to make them vertical instead of like slanted. Mm -hmm. And then I just counted the squares that the, they encompassed on the top. And then I multiplied that by three. So can I can I, let me see if I'm understanding what you're saying. So I'm imagining, so like imagining this is made jello wouldn't quite work. Um, but imagine I could push here, right? right. And I, I could push to the left so that the top fills in this space here. That's kind of what you're saying. You're, you you turned it into a rectangle. Right. Okay. And you felt confident. And so once you did that, then you were able to count. So when you pushed it, how far over does it go? Just to the first to the first, uh, the next box over from the top. So it went from the end to the first box over to the so edge. Here? Yes. And then on the other side, it went from the second box to the first box. Here? Yes. Okay. And But then the, the lines obviously were gonna be shorter so it could compress the space from the bottom to the top. So from this, smushing this in too. R right, because the space at the very bottom, the space mm -hmm. at the top, the line's gonna be longer when you when you straighten it from a angle to it being vertical up and down. So I, I love it. And I, I just wanna say, we're not gonna have, cause there's so much that I wanna talk about. I see that there are other strategies that people did and I love it that there are different ways that people are doing. Um, but Mark, I wanna thank you for 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 being our first volunteer um, and sharing that. One thing that I, I really liked about, I mean, there are lots of things I liked about what you did and there are also questions that I have and I see other people have those questions. Um, but one thing that I liked is, and it's a really important idea that I think is, is not intuitive, um, is that in area, you can move stuff around. The size of the surface is the size of the surface, 
right? But you can move things around as long as you keep the same size, as long as you keep the surface the same size, you can think about it differently. Um, and so that was that. And so now I'm going to kind of look at the the way that I found, because because again, I'm going to be sharing kind of my journey and making sense of each of these formulas. Um, but that was that was something that, that I use that same strategy, but in a, in a different way. But the, the idea of maintaining the size of that surface is something that that I did. Um, before I before I share that though, I just want to say that one thing that I tried to do in the packet, you'll see some of it here, but I'm going to skip some of the steps. Um, but I always tried to give opportunities for students to be counting squares and estimate, um, like so that the squares are actually on the shape for each shape, just so that they can that, that as a as a way in. Um, so I just wanted to say that that's an important step that I took, and and I just wanted to acknowledge it. Um, so some people in the in the for, in the in the chat mentioned, well, I multiplied the base times the height, and and if, you know that is the formula that's given on the formula sheet, and so I wanted to understand that because why why is that? Um, and so um, the formula is the area of a parallelogram is the base times the height. Um, and so again, that key idea is it's okay to move and shift these things around. The surface is the surface. Um, and so what I did, and, I, and I, I, I don't mean to be taking credit. There are several people in the chat who said they did something similar. Um, every parallelogram has a little, has a triangle that you can, a right triangle that you can pop, you can, you can identify. And so I imagine cutting it there and then pulling that piece over. OK, now I have a rectangle right now. I'm kind of back to a, I'm, I'm relating it to the first shape, kind of like the basic beginning idea of area um, that rectangle. And I know that the area of this rectangle, that's seven units by three units, is the same as the area of this parallelogram because the surface of the same. The, sh the shaded area is, is black here just to help you see it. But this total surface is the same as this total surface. Right. And so once I get to be here, I can multiply seven times three, or I can add seven units plus seven units plus seven units. Um, so that'll be 20, 21. Um, and another thing that occurs to me, and you know, a rectangle is a parallelogram. So anything that's true for parallelograms has to be true for rectangles. And when you look at base times height, even though this is a rectangle, you can think of it, well, this is the base and this is the height of that rectangle. And so you can really just use area equals base times the height um, because again, a rectangle is a parallelogram. Um, so we don't actually need to have two different formulas. Um, so so we're gonna we're gonna keep going on with with shapes. Um, so uh, oops, sorry. So this one I was familiar with, right? The, we're talking about the area of a triangle. Um, and when I say familiar with, I felt familiar with how to present this idea to students and kind of how to make sense of where that formula comes from. Here we have a, a triangle in, in blue. Um, and so if I double that triangle and flip it, I can turn it into a rectangle, right? And again, once I have this rectangle, I know that the area of this whole thing is going to be the length, one, two, three, four, five, six by three. So the area of this entire rectangle, the surface of this entire rectangle can be covered with 18 squares. And so that's the, the triangle is only going to cover half of those. So I'm going to cut it in half. So the area of this triangle would be nine. Um, and so we don't have time for it here. And I didn't have you grab a piece of paper. But one, one cool way, if you want to prove to yourself that a triangle is half of a rectangle, um, you don't just have to take my word for it. You can cut a rectangular piece of paper diagonally and rotate one of the triangle to cover the other triangle. Um, and you'll see that they're the same size and then also that they make uh, a rectangle. Um, but when I was teaching this to students, like I, you know, and, and give me a thumbs up if, if this has been your experience as well. I use this example, I used a right triangle, but I, but I knew that there are lots of triangles that are not as easy to see as this one, right? And I kind of, told students, oh, but all triangles kind of follow this thing. But but that wasn't good enough for me. And and um so so I I wanted to make I wanted to make more sense of it. So for example, what about this triangle? You can't easily imagine taking this triangle, doubling it, and making it into a rectangle, or I couldn't. 
right? And when teaching the area of triangles, I felt funny about examples like this because it's, you know, I wanted, I want, I wanted something that would work for everything. Um, and so what I found helpful was the fact that the formula is expressed, it's not one half length times width, it's one half base times height, which made me think about the parallelogram, right? The B, the, the B and the H, the base times the height made me make, look for some relationship with the parallelogram. And I realized similar to the, to the rectangle, that if I took that triangle, I could double it and flip it and I, any triangle, but in, in particularly this obtuse one, and I can create a parallelogram, right? Can't necessarily always create a rectangle, but I can create a parallelogram and I know what to do. I know how to find the area of a parallelogram, right? And I could even continue to, to kind of like work it back to a, to a rectangle by cutting it here and moving that over. Um, and so what I liked about that, doubling the triangles and making a parallelogram, the reason why that was more satisfying for me is the visual works for any triangle in any orientation, um, not just for, for right triangles. So I didn't feel like I didn't need to call upon students' trust. Because I, again, my, you know, my goal is I wanted them to be able to see. I want students to be able to see what it is and not have to take, too, not, not too early, at least, go to like, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Th this is an example that will speak for all other examples. Um, so, so I'm gonna just pause there, see if there are any any pressing questions um, or thoughts. It can you could also feel free. Don't I won't be interrupted if you put things in the chat as I'm talking. But but I'm just gonna wait, see if there are any questions before I continue. Okay, well, if, if if questions arise, oh, oh, awesome. I'm, 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 that makes me really happy to hear, Abby. Thank you for sharing that. Abby says, I have not had a clean way to show or make sense of the formula for non-right triangles. That is so great. That's how I felt, because I was like, for years I had been calling, I had been kind of resting on the fact that students believe me, because I'm a teacher and they'll kind of, but but I, I just wanted to hold myself to a higher standard for them. Um, and so, I yeah, I was really excited, because I always felt funny about it. Um, so uh, so here we have a different shape. Um, what is this shape? Anybody in the chat? What's this friend? <laughs> Natalie says trapezoid, exclamation point. I love it. That's how I feel about trapezoids. Um, how do we know? How do we know this is a trapezoid? What, what is a trapezoid? Vicky says trapezoid. We have named this beast. Not a beast, friend. Beasts can be friends. What am I saying? So we've got this family of, of quadrilaterals, a four-sided figure, um, and it's got two parallel sides. And it's got this formula. The area of this shape, and again, you know, we're looking, we can we can start by counting squares, right? And then we can figure out what to do with these these other pieces. Um Emily, yes, Emily adds once only one set of parallel lines, not two. If there were two, it would be a parallelogram. Um, thank you, Emily. And Leanne also says two non-parallel sides, which we have here. These two are not parallel. Um, but we have this, 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 the area of this shape equals one half the height times the sum of base one and base two. So we've got base and height. So, okay, so I'm thinking that somehow this could be related to a parallelogram because I've got bases and heights going on. But base one and base two, I had to think about that. Um, and and again, there's, uh, there's different ways to make sense of it. I've actually found a couple, but the one that I found the most visual and the most satisfying just for me personally was the one that, that I'm, I'm about to show. Um, Maybe. Okay, there we go. Um, so it was it's very similar to a triangle. Um, but I imagined so kind of like going from the top right, top left corner down. Um, so I imagined first doubling so that the the black trapezoid is kind of like the shadow trapezoid, um, and then flipping it and then connecting it. And any trapezoid, no matter what kind of weird trapezoid you might have, um, if you double it and flip it, you get a parallelogram. 
right? And so again, I was like, oh, okay. So for me, I can see the high. So so the, the area of this parallelogram is the base times the height, right? So it's the base, it's eight and two, so it's 10 times the height, which is three. And so the way that I made sense of that base one and the base two was, well, if you double it and flip it, you're going to have one of the bases, and then it's going to always be the other base, right? And so the sum of this is going to be the base of the, the parallelogram and then the height. So 10 times 3. And so then the area of this trapezoid is... Sorry, I was about to say 30, but whew, shame on me, because I forgot I did the same thing that I did with the triangle, which is I doubled it, right? So the area of this whole parallelogram is 30, 30 square units. It takes 30 squares to figure to cover this surface. And so if I want just this half of it, it's going to be 15. Okay. Um, so maybe if I could, let me, I'm going to stop here. I'd like a volunteer. So here's so here's the formula and here's the visual that I use and the visual that's in in the packet. Um, can I have a volunteer? Maybe use your own words and kind of help. How are you seeing the connection between the visual and that formula? Can I have a, have a brave soul? Not brave because we're all friend, but a wonderful soul. How, how do you connect the visual to this formula? So Ahmed says averaging the length to force the image into a rectangle. So I think that that is certainly another strategy for making sense of that formula. But I, I kind of want to. I'm, I'm asking a slightly different question than I did with the um, with the previous shape, which is not how you would do it, but what connection do you see between this visual um, and by, I guess by this visual I'm meaning anything on the slide um, with the formula that's there. Abby says it's out of order. I think the half should be outside of the volume, like one half height times base times base. So I think that's fantastic. What I would say is that it's it's not out of order, or maybe, it, well, what I would say is there are many orders that are possible, right? And so you have the power. If, if the way that you're kind of ordering the half and you're thinking of it, well, like the height times the base, and then I'm going to take a half of that whole thing, that's great, right? Because I think one of the things that I I want to to kind of stress that kind of that I maybe knew, maybe I would have said, but I didn't fully understand is that these those formulas are not written, they're they're not from on high, right? They're they're different ways and, and they're written and we can use them and they it's not different from what you've got there. Um, but I, I like your way too. Your way certainly can, helps me connect to the visual better. Um, so I think that that's, I just, all of that's to say, to say thank you. And I think that you're, I'm going to now call that the Abbey way, the Abbey Rosa method when I, when I use it that way. Um, Kelly says, by doubling the trapezoid, you're making a parallelogram. B1 plus B2 is the new base. Then we have to half it to get back to the original shape size. See, I've been talking for minutes and she said it perfectly in three sentences. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, so, um, okay. So let's, let's, let's keep going. So we're going to shift gears a little bit, um, not to a higher gear or harder gear, but a different gear. Um, 
So here is another section of the GED formula sheet. These are the formulas that are focusing on um, three-dimensional geometry. And so similar to when we looked at the, the two-dimensional geometry formulas, um, I'm going to cap the amount of time that we spend here because we could spend a lot of time here. But I do think it's valuable to just spend a couple of minutes looking at them. So for the next, let's say, two minutes, um, let's reflect on the formula that are here. And, and please share some things that you notice in the chat. when you look at this formula sheet. Natalie says, fractions. Kelly notices this section feels particularly overwhelming with all kinds of letters, capitalization, fractions. Oh my, right? We had lowercase b before, and now we've got capital Bs. What's going on with that? Are they the same? Is one just bigger, better? Yes, yeah. <laughs> as Emily said, now we've got a big B. Is there a relationship? Oh, sorry. Is there a relationship between big B and little b from the last set of formulas? A lot of pi symbols. Just a few of the letters are defined at the bottom. Yep. They put two equations on each line. Is there a reason to differentiate uh, surface area from area? That's a great question, Abby. Thank you for asking that. Um, one third and four thirds. Ooh, it's fun to show that visually. I thought so too. Um, I think so still. Um, lots of these shape names are unfamiliar to learners. Absolutely. Um, one thing, and I, I don't remember if I said this, I apologize if I did, but um, Kind of, we're we're gonna start getting into volume, uh, as or actually we're gonna start getting into three dimensional figures. But the three dimensional geometry packet has about twenty pages in the beginning that are all about naming different naming not just the shapes but naming the parts of the shapes, identifying those shapes in the real world, drawing and being able to sketch those shapes. Um, so we're not gonna do any of that today, but just to know that I I agree that that is a, a hugely important thing. Um, for for us, um, so these are these are all great. Thank you. Um, you know, I similarly I looked at it, and there's a lot here. There are twelve different formulas here. Um, also, you to kind of go back to points that people made in the beginning. For each of them, there's surface area and volume, which means you need to know the difference between surface area and volume, um, because they're both there. Right, So you, we could be dealing with a rectangular prism. That doesn't mean, oh, it's rectangular prism. That means it's a surface area question. Right, So you need to have an understanding of the both. Um, just looking at some of the other things, the S in the cone is, is unfamiliar. Absolutely. I assumed that all of those things would be unfamiliar. So again, that's why, but because there's no way to know it. They don't even define it, which is something that drives me bonkers. They define some things, but they don't define them all. Um, The other thing, a couple of other things that stood out to me um, is that we've got rectangular prisms and right prisms. And again, that's similar to rectangles and, and parallelograms. A rectangle, rectangular prism is a right prism. Um, so again, we have some, some redundancy or some duplication. Um, and um, But one thing that I did kind of like is, and people have said this already, there's, there's lots of duplication, right? Like Elizabeth said, there's a lot of pi, there's this big B, which is kind of an, a problem, but or not a problem, but it's it's like, wait a second, that's something I have to adjust to. But also there are many of them, right? So there's there's gonna be relationships between um, between these things. Um, so th this is awesome. Um, I'm gonna just wanted to, um, just a quick word on right prisms um, because it wasn't, it wasn't totally clear to me what that like, just to be make sure that we're all clear and we're all using it in the same way. So, so these are two prisms. I'm sorry. The the just to be clear, the one on the the right is not a right prism. So, the definition of a right prism is a prism where one base appears directly above the other base. So, this right here, and 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 right prisms are named for their their bases. So, this is a pentagon on each base. So, this is a pentagonal prism. Right, a triangular prism prism is going to have a triangle on top and a triangle on the bottom, and those prisms are going to be directly above each other. Um, all the prisms in the packet are right prisms because all the prisms on the GED are right prisms. The other kind of prism is it's 
it's called an oblique prism if, if that is of interest to you but but we're not talking about that we're talking about um about these shapes um so so it's it's 3 30 um so i know that we're a double session um and we i know there's a 15 minute break in between i would love to only take a 10 minute break since we're coming back i hope that that's okay however um, you want to handle it it's just fine <laughs> okay well but i also meant because just for everybody i appreciate that Andy. i appreciate that support yep. but f i hope that that's good for everybody um i'll speak slowly when we get started but not that slowly um, <laughs> so, so please um if you could um try to be back by 340 um and, and um maybe just by a show of thumbs up can uh people let us know you're back boom oh my gosh look at those thumbs up you guys are ready um Okay, so we're gonna yeah we're gonna dive dive right back in. I I appreciate you um, coming back five minutes early, and here we go. So I, I actually want to start us off um, well just to kind of take a step back and and remind us where we were. We're we're now shifting into um, three dimensional figures, right? We looked at the the formulas for the three dimensional geometry because that's the direction we're moving in. Um, and I wanted to return to a question that Abby Rosa posed in the chat. Um, Abby asks, and I just want to get it right. Is there a reason to differentiate surface area from area? Um, I don't quite have an answer to that. Is there a reason to? That's that that feels like a more open ended and and because that's you know that's Abby's Abby's bread and butter is to ask open ended and thoughtful questions. Um, there are there's a difference in the way that they're used. And, and and one that I felt like was important to um, discuss with students, um, but there is also a deep connection between them, which is why in the three-dimensional geometry packet, I start with surface area because um, in two-dimensional geometry, they've been they they work and understand a lot with 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 area, right? And so it's not a new concept, but we're applying it in a slightly different context. And what that different context is is surface area is basically um, well, area in general is about the size of a surface. When we talk about area, we're talking, if, if we're being precise, area is the surface of a two-dimensional figure. When we talk about surface area, we're talking about the surface of a three-dimensional figure, right? So it's a, that's the difference. But what's not different is the core question, which is we're still talking about how many squares it takes to cover a surface. Um, so, so I left this off. I left the photo that's up. Um, and Abby, please let me know in the chat if that. I know that that's not the reason why, but that's at least how I'm thinking of them differently. How what those two different words? I don't know that we need both, but I'm just trying to prepare students for the use of it. Without, because what I don't want is for them to think, oh, we're doing something different, right? And so I should I should not build on and call upon the wealth of knowledge that I've developed when it comes to area. Um, so thumbs up. Um, so so the image here, this is from the packet. Um, I'm a fan of their work, but in 2021, the artist Christo and Jean-Claude covered the uh, surface area of the Arc de Triomphe in, in Paris, France. Um, so you can see the what the arch looks like on the left, and then they covered it with fabric. Um, and it, what, what I enjoy about it is that's that's a perfect example of surface area. We have a three-dimensional shape, a three-dimensional figure, the, this, this arch, um, and they covered it with fabric. And it took them uh, 25, 000, over 25,000 square meters of fabric um, to, to cover it. Um, so, so in moving into surface area, um, and again, kind of this conversation is after these 20 pages where students have learned the names and the shapes and the solids and the different parts of the solid, the three-dimensional solids, um, identifying them in the real world and also practice sketching them, right? Because a lot of this, I, I want students, to, it's hard to, to sketch. Not everybody, you, I didn't want to assume that students, because I know that I was like, how do I sketch Cer certain shapes, three-dimensional shapes were not intuitive to me to, to, um, to, to sketch. And so I wanted to, to build that in. So that's, that's all happened kind of before students are getting to this to prep them. Um, so, but, so that said, um, in this packet, kind of whenever I do any new shape or any, any kind of new like surface area or volume, I start with an irregular shape an irregular 3D shape. So for example, um, this one. Um, and the reason why I do that is because there's no formula for the surface area of that shape, 
Um, there's not one right way to do it. Um, there are different ways for students to figure out the surface area. And again, also, it starts with that idea of counting and emphasizing the idea that we're covering a surface with surface with squares. And I just want to be clear and point out, even though there are cubes, what we're talking about is the surface of the shape. So we're talking about the squares that it would take to cover the outside surface of this shape. Um, so why don't you take a minute, actually, um, and don't don't type it in the chat yet. But 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 kind of figure out how many squares does it take to cover? And I mean, like, you know, all the way around. This is kind of a donut shape. So I mean, like in the donut hole as well. Um, what's the surface area of this teal shape? How many squares does it take to cover that surface? I'll give you a little bit, a couple of seconds to, to put it in the chat. But again, don't hit enter yet. Um, if you want, you'll likely break it into pieces, to chunks. So if you want extra an extra challenge, you can write your answer as an expression, like I added this plus this plus this. But but that's not but but just the number of squares that you think it takes to cover that surface is is plenty. Maybe about ten more seconds. Okay, you can all hit enter. Waterfall of of numbers. I asked for expressions and I got expressions and so now I have to add them up. See <laughs> okay. Good, good. So I'm seeing I'm seeing a range of answers. Um, I think the smallest one I've seen is twenty five, uh, thirty two, one hundred twenty eight is the largest. Um, but the mode most, the most common answer, uh, there are four people said 96. So since that's the one that most people said, I'm, I'd like to hear from that. I'm actually, and I'm going to look, Leanne says outside, she says 96, outside plus inside plus top plus bottom. And then she says 40 plus um, 24 plus 16 plus 16. Leanne, I'm wondering if you are able and willing to unmute and kind of explain how you counted those 96. Oh, sure. I started looking at the outside, which we can see two sides of the outside, and there's 10 on each. All the sides seem to be the same length, so 40. So, so, so okay, so just to, to, so you're seeing this is the outside, right? Right. And so you saw one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10 here, and 10 here. So, where do you get 40? Uh, I figure the back sides are the same. They both seem mm -hmm. to be five across. Okay. And two high. So we've got 40 going around the outside here. So that's 40. Okay. Please continue. Then I looked inside. I can see the inside donut hole looks like it's three across and two high for each of those. So six, 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 and six. Mm -hmm. Poof, not three, but four of them. So not six, six, six. So we've got one, two, three, one, two, <laughs> three. And it's and and you're right, like there is a challenge here, right? Because we can't, we have to, we have to imagine things that we can't see. But if we look here, we can see that well, this is three wide and two down, and this is three wide and two down, right? So when we're imagining this, it's six here, six here, six there, it's six there. So that's four sixes. So we had 40 on the outside, then we have 24 on the inside. Okay. And then I counted the top. We can see it all, so we could just count around 16. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Okay. And then assuming the bottom is the same. Mm-hmm. 
So that would be 16 plus 16, which is 32. Or I'm sorry, you, but you, you didn't, you had 16, you had it actually written out like that, right? I so we, <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. So we had 40 around the outside, 24 around the inside, 16 on top, and 16 on the bottom. Oh, some people are changing their answers. Good. Okay, and again, I'm not, and and I, you know, I'm not that concerned about the answer. What the idea is 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 you understand a concept, right? You understand that we're talking about squares, and we're practicing, and we're we're testing, we're challenging that that understanding because there's lots of obstacles to being able to count the squares here. We can't see them all, um, and yeah. So, so when we're talking about surface area, we're talking about. Um, covering this now but again similar to when we were looking at area and we had the the squares are here even though we can't see them all we can make sense of the shape and figure out the ones that we can't see but as many things in the world are not covered with squares when we talk about area many things in the world are not covered with squares when we talk about surface area um actually i should just to this is all real this is really happening look my, my house is covered with these things. This box really exists. I really did take that picture. Um, but so so the first the first surface area formula on that 3D geometry um, formula page is for the rectangular prism. So here we have a rectangular prism, um, a shoe box. Um, and it's a rectangular prism. It's got six sides. Um, and so finding the surface area means finding the area of each of those sides. So in geometry, there is a tool or I don't know if it's a tool, but it's an idea at least um, of a net. Um, and a net, this is a this is an, an, a net of that shoe box. So in in geometry, we can use nets to help us keep track of the sides and the surfaces of three dimensional objects. Um, nets can help us understand and and figure out what the surface area is. Um, so the idea of a net is something that could be folded up into this three-dimensional shape. In, in this case, I started with the three-dimensional shape and then cut it up um, so that I could see all of the sides. But here, one, two, three, right? I can't see all of the sides. I can only see three out of the six. But when I have a net, one, two, three, four, five, six, I can see all six of the sides. Um, and so I wanted to start here just because I want you to imagine being able to, here's a net and folding it up to make this rectangular prism. Elizabeth says, does anyone else never learn the math definition of net? Um, is there a math definition? I, I only know the definition of a net as far as I've used it. If there is a, if there's another definition, please, I don't, you please let us all know. Um, or I don't know if you meant what I said as a definition. Because yeah, for me, for me, it was fish. You know, uh, yeah, exactly. Or butterflies. It's just, it's it's just it. such a funny word to use in this context when we know it from other contexts. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so, so here we, so now we, so we, here we have a diagram of another rectangular prism. Um, it's related, similar, but you know, it's different, they have different, uh, measurements. And so I also want to give you the net for this rectangular prism. Um, and I want to give you a second to imagine folding up this net to make this rectangular prism. And I know some of you, because your teachers are like, oh, I wish, or what I would have done is put colors here so that I could, I could, and absolutely you are correct, but I I, I'm, I want to, I want you to exercise the muscle that you don't have yet. So I did, I, on purpose, I didn't do that. Um, but I also think that that's a great idea, particularly, I'm just being mindful of that question about pre-GED students um, and, and ways to modify everything that I'm doing. Um, but I but I particularly didn't because I want you just to take a second and see if you can imagine folding up this net to create to recreate this or to create this rectangular prism. Um, take take some take. Let me give you just a second. And stop talking. So to help. I'm going to, hopefully this works. Hopefully you're seeing a different screen now. Um, this is a free web resource, uh, a math uh, app, app, a math app called Polypad, um, which allows you to do lots of different things. One of them is to create uh, shapes. So this is, I created a rectangular prism um, that 
looks like the one we have here. It's got kind of a teal on the side, blue on top, uh, magenta. <laughs> My daughter would argue, but some reddish color on the front. Um, so here's that rectangular prism. And I'm going to show you, um, to, or I'm going to not show you, I'm going to help you share something that helped me figure out how to envision folding it up. So here we have the six sides, and we can fold it up and unfold it. Right, we can move it around. Just see, so the top, you see the top kind of unfolds. I'll do it slow, All right? Just to make sense. You know, and there's lots of work we can do with nets, but just if it's a new idea, um, it was new. I mean, I had maybe heard of it, but I had not played with it in this way. So, um, so I just want you to be able to see that net. And, and I'm gonna in the resources you'll you'll you get a link to that. You'll be able to play with it a little bit more. Um, so what I'd like you to do now um, is, in any way that you'd like, using the information that's there, um, I'd like you to tell me what the surface area of this rectangular prism is. How many squares does it take to cover the surface of this uh, that rectangular prism? And you can you can put it in the chat. So I'm seeing a lot of agreement in the chat. I'm seeing at least seven people who have said 72. Um, so that's 72, here's another person, 72 squares it takes to cover. Um, so I'm seeing a lot of the same answers. Oh, good, there's a 36, nice, 72, another 72. I'm curious if, if someone who says 72 could tell us how they did it. Um, I, I, I want to call in folks, but I'm not sure who's like actually able to speak. So I'm going to leave it uh, to a, a volunteer. But um, how did you get 72? I can speak, I guess. Um, who, who, I, this who is, this I... is Mark Wackerfuss. Okay. So I counted the uh, um, the number of squares horizontally against the long side, which is 10. And then I counted the vertical side, which is six. So 10 times six is 60. And then I counted the two small ends, one that there were six each, six times two is 12. So 60 plus 12 is 72. Okay, so let me, um, I'm gonna, you are the brain and I'm the hand. So let me see if, if, I, if I am understanding what you're saying. So first, just let me clarify, just to be sure, you're talk, you use the net, you use the net to figure it out. Is that true? Yes. Okay. So you said you you kind of saw all of these sides, which are four different sides of the of the rectangular prism, but you kind of saw it as one large rectangle. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten units across. And then one, two, three, four, five, six down. So it's ten plus ten plus ten plus ten plus ten plus ten, or sixty, or ten times six. So the, the area of this rectangle, this large rectangle, you said that's sixty. Right. And then you said this piece here is six, this piece here is six. So that's 12. So 60 plus 12 is 72. That's correct. Okay. That's how you saw it. So awesome. Thank you. The bird agrees as well. Um, awesome. So thank you very much for that. Can I have someone else who maybe did anybody see it in a different way? Did anyone put together the, the shapes that put together? answer this question in a different way from how Mark thought about it. Hi, 
Hi, this is Patricia McNeese. How are you tonight? Or Hi, today? Patricia. I'm Hi. great. How are you? All right. So I'm a visual person. So when I looked at this, I saw that on one side we had 12, which means on the other side we have to have 12. On the top, we have 18, which means on the bottom we have to have 18. On the ends, we had six on one side. That means we have to have six on the other, which equals 12. So when I did that, it was 24, 18 plus 18 plus 12 equals 72. Excellent. So I am also a visual learner. So I'm going to try to visualize what you just said. Um, so you tell me if I'm right. You're the brain. I'm just the hand here. Um, okay. So and I forget if you said the top or the side first, but you said first. I'm the side. OK, so you said you saw 12 here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 10, 11, 12, right? And teal. Mm -hmm. And then you said, okay, well, there's 12 here. There's going to be 12 on the other side. So that's 24. Correct. Okay. Then you said, okay, there are 18 on the top, right? One, two, mm -hmm. three, four, five, six by three. So 18 on the top. So 18 on the top plus 18 on the bottom mm -hmm. is going to be 36. Yep. And then there are three, excuse me, there are six here. And then six, therefore, would be in the back. And so then that would be 12. So 12 plus 36 plus 24 is 72. Correct. Awesome. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So so super cool. And I see in the chat that there are even different ways that people are doing. Um, and But I appreciate that, that just by chance, it happened to be Patricia and Mark who shared um, out loud. And one person used the net, and one person used um, the the uh, the the constructed rect rectangular prism. Um, the approach that I take in the packet is that um, you know there are lots of ways. If we're talking about the surface area of a rectangular prism, there are lots of ways to add up the area of each side. The formula is one way, um, but there are lots of ways. We just saw two ways that are neither of which are exactly the formula. One of them is maybe similar to the formula, but that's not, she wasn't using the formula um, when, when she conceived of it. And so obviously it was Patricia's method because I said, um, but, but the formula is one way, but, but the idea is that there's, we know a lot about rectangles, right? We know a lot about area because that's what we've been working on, right? And so we can apply that here. It doesn't need to be the one particular way. And I think it's valuable for students to see that there are multiple ways to figure it out um, and that those ways can come from them, right? Or it can come from their classmates. And that's why I, I spend time in the packets um, in lots of situations, but certainly in this one when I'm introducing the surface area of, of rectangular prisms um, to get students thinking about um, their own methods um, for, for how to put piece that together. Um, and, you know, for, for, for teachers who sometimes I know get nervous, oh, well, my student, I'm not sure if my students could do that. I guarantee, I, I promise you that every student, every class has just as wide a range of ways that people put, I mean, because they have some tools here, right? Different, just as many ways as we came up with to put, um, to count the squares here, um, students can, can come up with that as well. Um, so, uh, so just to, I just wanted to see how it looks um, with a specific formula that they give us on the formula sheet. So the formula for a rectangle that is, again, I'm not recommending this. I'm just part of my part of my my goal is helping students make sense of these shapes. Part of it is understanding what's there on, on, on the formula sheet. So the formula that they give for the uh, surface area of a um, rectangular prism is the surface area equals two L two times L times W, the length times the width, which they don't define, but two times the length times with the width plus two times the length times the height plus two times the width times the height. Now one thing that I don't love about this, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna like tear down every or I'm not even tearing down this this um uh this this formula, but one one thing that makes it more complicated, more obtuse than I think it needs to be is the fact that if, if I rotated this shape around, what we might call the length, the width, or the height would change. But the relationship doesn't change, and none of that changes. Because um, really, I can start anywhere. Like if I'm going to multiply across, I can pick anything to be the length um, and then use the, uh, use the shapes, use the, the sides that I haven't chosen. So all that's to say, 
it's maybe more confusing than it needs to be, but certainly it's there. It's there for them. And it, it, I think you'll, the question I'll put out there, just to, having heard Patricia's way of visually kind of looking at it, um, how her method relates to what, what the formula is. Um, so just, it doesn't have to be six, but for the, I had to start, I have to pick one to be on a slide. Um, I'm gonna call the length, the six, the length, right? So if that's six, I'm gonna call this the width. And so two times six times three. And I here I did color coordinate it so you can see what parts I'm talking about. And I'm gonna add that. So that's the area of this. Why am I multiplying it by two? That same idea that Patricia said, right? I've got 18 on the, I've got six times three on the top and I've got six times three on the bottom. Same thing here. If the length is six, I'm gonna call the height two. So six times two is 12. Also on the other side, so I'm gonna double it. And then here, two times three is six. And then on same thing on the other side, and then I get the same answer. Again, it works. It gets this, you get, we get the same answer that we got, but there are lots of other ways. Um, and there are challenges to using this way that I just wanted you to have that experience. And I certainly want students to have that experience of finding it in, in, in multiple, in other ways. Um, so now we're going to look at another right prism, right? Because again, rectangular prisms get their own um, formula, but but there is another formula, um, but we don't need to use it in the same way. So, so I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. So I just want to say we're going to look at another right prism, and that prism, that right prism is a triangular prism. So here is our friend, the triangular prism. Um, so so just take take I'm going to give you two minutes for this and I just want you to I want to point out the question the question is not what is the surface area of this triangular prism um, it is not that it is how would you find the surface area of this triangular prism um, so take take a couple minutes um, and and toss that around and if you find one way see if you can find a different way All right, so, um, so I want to I want to start sharing. Um, it's okay if you haven't gotten an answer yet, because again, I'm not I'm not looking for an answer. I'm less interested in in the answer right now, and I'm more interested in how you took apart this solid, this this triangular prism, um, and tried to make sense of its surface area. Um, so I'm just curious how how did folks how did you get started? I see uh, Leanne wrote in the chat, two triangles and three rectangles. 
right? Or two triangles and one larger rectangle. So again, kind of thinking about this like a net. So that's cool. So if that's different from how you approached it, maybe take a second. Um, I have some visuals to help, but maybe just take a second just looking here and see if you can imagine what Leanne might be imagining when she's looking at this shape, this solid, and saying two triangles and three rectangles or two triangles and one larger rectangle. Okay, it looks like, sounds like Elizabeth saw something similar. Abby, and maybe this will help people see, Abby adds some colors to that. So Abby saw three white rectangles and a red parallelogram, ooh, made of two of the two triangles, right? So if we put those triangles together, absolutely, we will get a, 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 a parallelogram, nice. Uh, Emily says, find the area of one triangle and then double it, and then find the area of one side of the rectangle and triple it, and then find the sum of those. Okay, that is interesting. So I really, I mean, for everybody, Emily, Abby, everybody who's sharing here, I really appreciate Um you're thinking about that shape and you're breaking it up because that's what I want students to be able to do too. I, I want them to have that power to recognize we're just talking about the service. We know a lot about that service. We can put it together. We don't need to use only the formula um, that may be alienating or off-putting or maybe we don't have a full handle on, um, or maybe we do, but there's still power in, in us finding our own way. So thank you. Thank you for all of these. Keep them coming. Um, so I want to, um, I'm gonna just share again, just I, I I've said this I think a couple of times, but this is just how I made sense of it. And so um, if it's different from yours, yes. Um, but just uh, just in the spirit of sharing how I was thinking about it, I think my 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 method or my way of visualizing it was similar to some that have come up. So maybe it'll help add some visuals um, to what's already out there. Um, but so I started uh, with 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 this figure, and I, I created a net model for myself. So kind of finding the area of each side, um, understanding that this has one, two, two triangular sides, and then three rectangular sides. Um, so I just kind of like wanted to imagine it, it laid out. Um, because there's no obligation to use the formula on the formula sheet. Uh, if students understand the concept and they can figure out the surface area by any other measurement in their own methods, that's what they should use. And so that's what I did. Um, and so similar to 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 um, what I do with um, the it, it's similar to this, right? I want to get I gave you some time, not as much time as I give students, but I gave you some time to figure out your own way of piecing it together. Um, but but for me, um, I did, and I I, I appreciate um, I did the same kind of thing. I did the same thing that Emily did when I first started thinking about this. I was like, it's a triangle. There are three sides, and they're equal. And, and I actually got the same, I got the same thing. But the net helped me kind of keep, one thing that I really like about nets, it's it, again, it's, it's not that everybody should do them, but one thing that I find helpful about them is they kind of help me keep track of all of the measurements and kind of build and see what it is that I'm building. Um, because that helped me see that, oh, wait, actually, no, this, this one rectangle, why isn't it working out? Because I tried it with the formula and it didn't work. And I was like, oh, wait, that's something, what happened? And it's because um, these rectangles are actually very close in size, but they are not totally um, in the same. Um, and so, but then I, I did it similar to how people described, I kind of thought of the, the, the triangles um, as two separate triangles. I really like Abby's idea of kind of putting them together and, and, and treating them as a, as a parallelogram. Um, because usually we have to cut them in half, but here we have two. So that's that's actually kind of nice. Um, and then I thought of of these three. So if this is five, and this is six, and this is five, and then the height here is 11. So it's 55 plus 66 plus 55 plus 12 plus 12, or, or, or however different, you know if you make this 24, however you combine those numbers, but those were, those were the areas. Those are the, the, those are the sizes of those surface, um, surfaces. But the formula sheet doesn't, I mean, it certainly doesn't say use your own knowledge to, um, to piece this together. What the formula sheet says is for, it doesn't even say triangular prism. It says for right prism, it doesn't specify different types because they all follow the same formula. It says the surface area of a right prism is equal to P times H plus two capital B. 
So lots and lots of lots of new letters. Um, yes, Emily say the same, absolutely the same. Um, but here they do define some of those terms. So I just that's an important part of 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 what they've put here, where P is the perimeter of the base, H is the height of the prism, and B is the area of the base. Okay, so that okay. <laughs> There's a lot of a lot of pieces, but I've got a, I've got a net, I've got some tools. So let's let's kind of think about this is how I pieced it together. So the first thing I said, okay, the perimeter of the base. So the base is the are the, is the triangles, right? Because if I if I put this on a triangle, if if I stand this on a triangle, the other triangle is going to be directly above. So that's what defines the base of a right prism. And so the perimeter of that triangle is here, right? That's the perimeter of the triangle. And what's cool, what I, what the what the net helped me do is it helped me see, okay, well, what happens when I unfold this into a net? So so take if whatever you're doing, look at look at your screen. Um, so that's the perimeter of the triangle, and that's what happens to the perimeter of the triangle when we unfold it, right? The five is here, the five is here, and the six is is still the middle part. So I okay, so I was understanding that. That I see that there's some connection here between the perimeter of this triangle and this this rectangle. Um, so so pushing further, um, I started thinking, and I and actually just to, I'm going to focus on that rectangular part because I felt you know I so to be the the notation is not the notation is what makes this complicated because B is the area of the base. So another way of saying the area of the base is just the area of this triangle and the area of this triangle, and there's two of them, so that's one way. So so that the notation is new, but the idea I get that. But this P and H that that still felt like a concept I didn't fully understand. Um, certainly not enough to be able to listen to what students were saying and and hear what hear what how they might be identifying it. Um, so so if I I think about each of these. So here's the sides of the triangle, five and six and five. And so I, the way I thought of it was thinking about it separately. So 11 times five is 55, 11 times six is 66. So when I add all these together, it's 176, right? But I can also multiply this by the 16. And what's that 16? Where did that 16 come from? Well, the 16 is that perimeter, right? And I realize that that's always going to be the case. Right? When I've got a triangle, it's always going to open up. The perimeter of that is always going to form that top side of the rectangle. And so that, that perimeter multiplied by the height is going to give me the surface area of that piece. And, and, and several people said they started thinking about that with the net. So they didn't need the formula to do this. But they thought, oh, well, I can think of that as three separate rectangles. Or I can take it kind of like Mark did when we looked at the rectangular prism. I can see that as one one large uh, rectangular prism. Or excuse me, one large rectangle. Um, so um, so that's 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 kind of how I started to make make sense of it, right? We know that one side of this triangle of this rectangle is equal to the height, and the other side is equal to the perimeter. Um, and so then just to kind of go back to the the bigger picture, right? That 16 is right here. So instead of thinking this as three separate, I can think of it as the one, one larger one. Again, that's I want to understand where that comes from. I'm I felt good about kind of puzzling. It took me some time to puzzle through it. Um and actually I, I will say one thing that I don't think I said in the beginning. You could look online, like there are, this is there are knowable ways, but I just want to encourage you to not jump to Googling it and just really spend the time because it certainly will take you more time, but you will you will own it. You will feel a lot more confident um, and more comfortable kind of giving students their own space. If, Cause kind of, if you look at, if, if I, I, I will speak only for myself, if I watch something that prepares me to, to talk, to repeat what it is that I saw, but it doesn't prepare me in the same way to help somebody else kind of find their own way. So, um, so I, I, I do recommend that, but, but I just, I did want to just reiterate the same thing I said with the rectangular prism that this formula is here and it will work and we can make sense of it. It's not from on high. It's not magical there there. We can make sense of it from the knowledge that we have, but also it's not the only thing. Um, it's not the only way we, you all found methods that were, um, just as good, just as effective. Um, Okay. 
Um, Andy and Elizabeth, I'm just going to check in, right? We are, we have 11 minutes. Is that true? That's correct. That's You're correct. at 419. Yep. Okay. Um, so it's exciting. We're going to talk a little bit more and then I'm going to skip a whole bunch of, it'll be like another trailer. Um, but, um, but before I, before I do that, I do want to, um, spend a little bit of time thinking about, um, yes. I do, Patricia is saying, what was the four feet that made you rethink everything? It's huge. And I, I, I'm glad you said that because I don't want to, I, I did skip over it, but I, the idea of what's the base and what's the height, there are different bases and there are different heights going on here. And it's not simple. It's not to be taken for granted that the four is one particular kind of height. The 11 is a particular kind of height. The 11 is kind of a base. I mean, it's sitting on that. If you imagine like a Toblerone bar, right? But that's not what the base is in terms of what we're looking at. So, so all of that's to say all of that stuff is really important. And that's why there's a lot of, of activities because it's, it's, not, it's no joke. Um, it's serious. Uh, well, it's all serious, but OK. Um, so <laughs> what is the answer? Yes. Antoinette, no, I'm I'm sorry. You're asking, and I I will I will honor that. Um, uh, I don't remember off uh, one ninety. If you add one hundred and seventy six plus twenty four, you will find the answer. Um, that is the the that is the area of this the triangle, the area, the triangle, and the area of that rectangle. You got it. Thank you for asking. I appreciate your voice, uh, or your well, yeah, it's your voice. It's it's in written form, but it's still your voice. Um, so I want to look at um. Just want to give you a taste of of volume because it was kind of a a, a a connective thread that I found that I found very useful, um, and so you know there's a lot of a lot more time um, in the packet. There's like four or five pages introducing volume and the units of volume and the difference between volume and surface area, which is all really important. Um, but for our time together, for our time together, you only get one side, um, which is to kind of look at the three units. What inches is what is a unit of measure of of length. Square inches or square units are a unit of um, area, and cubic inches are uh, a measure of volume. When we're when we're talking about volume, when we, when we talk about area and surface area, we're measuring how many squares it takes to cover a surface. When we measure volume, um, we we're measuring it based on how many cubes it takes to fill the space inside of that object. Um, so, um, I have plenty of objects. Actually, you know what? I don't want to rush. I want to stop for a second. Deb is raising a reasonable question. Why is the triangle considered the base here? Right? You consider the base, and, and the reason why is because in 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 when we're talking about right prisms, what makes a prism, the definition of a right prism is that idea of um that the base is directly above the other base, right? So if you think about if that's the definition, if you think about this rectangle there's no rectangle directly above it so that can't be that can't be the thing that defines it um as a right oh thank you for asking deb because antoinette is saying it's also her concern it's something i talk about a lot in the packet because i like i did this on purpose i in the packet i could have put the base i could have i could have put the triangle in a way that made the triangle sitting on the bottom but I, it's it's important to think about. It's important to understand what we're talking about because these shapes. I mean, you know, in the world, shapes come in all different orientations, and on the GED, they may come in in different orientations as well. Um, but it, the idea of the base is it connects to that definition of a right prism. Um, so so thank you for asking. I hope that a answers a little bit. Um, and I would I would just also say that um, it. Uh, in the packet, there's more of an explanation, but also more of an idea about how uh, you might raise it with students. And again, you know, you're all, you know, the the packets are not teacher proof. I don't even know what that would mean. Like, an easy way to kind of like decide. You you will make decisions, and so if you decide the thing I want to do with my students is talk about rectangular prisms that are sitting on the excuse me triangular prisms that are sitting on the triangle, then absolutely you should start with that. You know, that's. I just had to make some choices to to mur uh, mucky up the water. Mucky up the water? I don't know if that's a word. Um so 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 um so thank you. Thank you both for your question.
Um, I'm going to skip, but I'm going to go slow so you can kind of see what's here that we're not going to talk about. You will have access to the slides, but also in a more substantial way, all of these things are from the packets. All of the images um, and the and the framing of it are from the packets. So um, it's kind of a fun little. Actually, I'm you know I'm just gonna skip ahead because this is gonna drive everybody bonkers. It makes for bad video, bad recording. Because I do want to spend a couple of minutes um, reflecting. Yes. Um. So, so I know that that was a lot, and I appreciate your uh, perseverance and 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 again spending that time and 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 trying these things out. Um, so I just, I mean, I know you'll, hopefully you'll be thinking about this, you know, some of the things that have come up for you, but, but I, I find it helpful to give some space and some time, um, right now, while kind of you're in this, the feeling and I, I wanted to give some, some space for feeling today. So, um, so I just, here's the reflection, something that resonated with me today was, I think that it is important because, and therefore I plan to, um, maybe, I'd just love to hear what what people are thinking where you're at. You can do it in the chat or we can we can unmute, but I, I would love to just take a couple minutes. Um, uh, Emily, I do see your question. I'll, I'll answer it. I'll, I will, we will get to that. I will answer it. I see it. So thank you for asking. Anyone willing to share kind of what's what's resonating? Patricia says connecting to visual learners. <laughs> the use of nets, nice. Um, Patricia, what I would say is that everybody's a visual learner. Like visuals help everybody kind of make sense of things. It's a different way to take in the information. And so, yeah, so I just, I, I really, I, I appreciate the visual, the, the power of the visual. Laura says, the concept of nets was really helpful to me, and I can see it being really helpful with my students. Elizabeth shares, even teachers get confused and have to really stop and think about these formulas. That's important because learners need to know it's not just them. I plan to use more nets. Um, the fact that I never thought about taking the prism apart to see all the sides, um, the nets. Cool. Well, I want to be mindful of your time. So thank you for, for that. Um, the formulas freak students out. This is definitely not freaky. Awesome. Uh, I wish students could join meetings like this sometimes. Well, they can. They're called your classes. Um, you know, you guys are... Well, I, I have a kind of a final word to that. But, um, but, I, but I do think students come to those meetings, and I think it's your classes. Um, just in terms of, of kind of wrapping up a couple of things... Um, so collecteddny.org. Um, so I work for CUNY, which is in New York, but this is a website um, with tons and tons of teaching resources. All the resources that I develop or curate um, as part of my CUNY adult ed team go here. Um, so there's lots of resources here, um, including, but not, not only, but including um, the packets. Um, so if you go to that website, you can find these are the two packets we've been looking at, but just as a, as a kind of reminder, um, there are there are many packets um, in in many in in many of the content that's covered on the GED. Um, you can find them all on the website. This is the direct. Oops, shoot. Sorry. This is the direct email, um, and all of this I'm going to share with you. But just so you so you know what those links are when you when you see the resource page. Um, I apologize. I don't remember who asked. Or, uh, Emily maybe asked what GRASP was. Um, GRASP is just it's an acronym, and it's the um, it's the name of the distance learning program. In, in New York. So that's why they're called fast track grasp programs because they were developed for a variety of different um, programs. Grasp is just the official, but it, it it's used in, in far wide reaching places than that. Um, 
Uh, I am looking forward to reading all of your comments. Keep them coming in. I do want to get you guys out, be respectful of your time. So I just want to end it here, which is please, here's some ways to keep in touch with me. Um, that's my name. That's my um, uh, email address. Please feel free to email me if you have any questions. I'm super curious, any feedback. Um, you know, if you if you do look at the packets and you do use them, um, if you find them useful, I would love to hear. Um, if you find them to have problems or things you would change or things that went well, all of that stuff. I'm just super curious. Um, I'm really grateful for the work that you all do. I think it's really important. I think anything I can do to support that makes me feel good. So um, so please keep in touch. Um, that bit.ly uh, at the bottom there and also that QR code, if you just want to pull it up on your phone, it's the same link that uh, Elizabeth has, has very kindly been dropping in the chat. Um, and it's just the resources um, for what I've shared today. Um, on the, what's it, uh, the Shed app, there's also a PDF of the resource page and also the PDF of the slides. So you can see the ones that we didn't get to. Um, although probably a more rich, a richer experience will be to look at them in the packet. Um, and just as a final plug, um, you know, I'm, I'm also a member of a group called the Adult Numeracy Network, and that is our website, which is also on the resource page. Um, but the Adult Numeracy Network is the professional organization for educators who work in adult education. Um, who are teaching math. And it could be people who are math teachers or ESL, like anybody who's kind of working with adult students um, for uh, in math. Um, and just our network is a place to share the joys and the challenges and the resources and the insights for teaching and learning math um, and, and learning and numeracy skills for, for, our, for our students. So so, so that's what I've got. Um, it's 4.30. So again, I want to be super respectful of your time, but thank you all.